Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome to On the Birds. This is Zach Spedden joined by Bob Phelan. Nick Stevens is out this week. We hope to have him back next week. But on tonight's episode, Bob and I will talk about the call-up of Kyle Stowers and his major league debut tonight as the Orioles take on the Blue Jays Monday night. But first, we are joined by the voice of the Delmarva Shorebirds, Sam Zelenick. Sam, how are you? I am doing great. Thanks for having me on, guys. I'm sure no recent events have uh, influenced you having me on here today. It's just my charismatic personality that brought me here. Absolutely. Well, yeah. <laughs> Fun fact, we did have Sam booked before the news <laughs> broke that Heston Kerstad was promoted to Del Marva last week. And we're going to get into Heston in just a minute. But I want to start off with kind of looking at the Swordbirds team as a whole. This is a pretty unique team for Orioles fans because while the higher levels of the system have shown the depth of the farm system, the Swordbirds this year have a lot of very young, high upside, mostly international guys who haven't been lighting up stat sheep or learning the life of professional baseball over a full season. Could you give your perspective on how the season has gone from a development perspective, wins and losses aside? Yeah, so that is the biggest thing is the wins and losses. This is what I try to preach every night in the broadcast, whether when the Shorebirds were good in 2019 or the team that we had last year that was a ton of fun to watch with the college guys after the draft that won a lot. At the end of the day, it, even when you're winning a lot, it doesn't matter. It, it's great. It, everybody's happier. But at the end of the day, it's whether or not the player at the start of the year got better over the course of the year by the time the season ends. Um, so Felipe Rojas Jr., the manager this year, has done a phenomenal job of drilling that into every guy's head. Uh, some guys it takes a little bit longer to get there because a lot of them, some of the other non-international guys come from college programs where it was focused on winning and trying to get away from that is hard. And then for the international guys, it's just trying, they, for the first time, are playing in front of big crowds, under lights, and it's not fun to get booed <laughs> um, if you're not playing well. So trying to get past that mental barrier, I think, is what the first third of the season has been about. And now as we get into that second third, it's going to be about, okay, can we get comfortable? And I think we've started to see over the past couple of weeks that more guys are starting to get comfortable. Isaac De Leon is playing better. Pitching staff after some rocky outings has been showing a lot of great stuff as well. So I think that what they set out to do at the beginning of the year was it was no secret that it was going to be hard from a wins and loss standpoint. They you know, they weren't trying to bluff anybody with that. But I think they have stayed true to the message that every day somebody in this locker room is going to make a step forward. And I think to this point in the season, they've actually been able to do that. Yeah, not to mention the cold weather. I mean, these guys are from warm weather climates. And, you know, if they played professionally last year, it was for a couple months in the summer, you know, with two days off a week. Now to go six days a week, six days in a row in colder weather in April and a little bit of May. Yeah, it's definitely a big time adjustment. The on opening night, uh, it was. I'm sad that he's no longer with the team anymore. But happy he got promoted. Daryl Hernandez was trying to explain to most of the Latin guys as Daryl was our main bilingual figure um, that how cold it was going to be in Salisbury that opening night in April, and they literally could not 
fathom in their brains what it was going to be like <laughs> and trying to explain to somebody how many layers you need to wear for that kind of cold if they've never truly experienced anything close to it they have no idea what it's going to be like <laughs> and the moment you try to play baseball in that after it's not going to go well for anybody and we've seen the velocity start to creep up especially with the pitchers that's been the biggest thing i've noticed as well as hitters just being a little bit more comfortable in the box you know letting pitches get deeper on them, come in on the hands, because the first time these guys happen to get stingers off the end of the bats, but that that's a very unique sensation that happens in the cult. The first time you, you have it happen, you're like, oh my God, am I going to lose my hands? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And yeah, speaking of Daryl Hernandez, you know, he, he I think he was disappointed to return to Delmarva after he had a pretty good year last year, considering his age, he hit for a decent average, didn't walk a ton or hit for much power, but he didn't let it get him down. He came in and just really lit the world on fire to start the season, hit him for more power. He matched his home run total from last year in just a month and a half and and earned that promotion to Aberdeen, like you said. How, how great was it to see that development from year to year? That was honestly my favorite storyline of the first couple of months because it wasn't just, you know, Daryl got on a heater and, you know, happened to have a hot streak that coincided with the start of the season. I think that that's just the new him. And I think that swing that we saw was always in there. It was just about getting it out more often. He seemed to be way more confident at the plate. His approach was more confident. His takes were more confident. And then when he fired off his swing, it was with the full intent of, I am going to do damage. Not, I'm just here because I'm 19 and I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing. It's now, okay, I'm a good baseball player. Let's go show everybody about it. And he took being put back in Delmarva really in stride. He understood... Uh, how the system is currently shaking out as far as the number of middle infielders and some of their ages and knew that the guys that were put up at Aberdeen ahead of him, although, you know, maybe in Daryl's mind, he's better, he's worse, whatever they are. They are, no matter how you look at it, they are older than him. Um, so their timelines and their progressions have to be a little bit faster. So putting Daryl back, he understood was just a symptom of that. And then he said, okay, I'll go out and force your hands. And he did. Um, it was just one of those really, really great things to see where he got str basically everything the Orioles asked of him, he went out and did, which I think portends to, to Daryl that he's going to be a very good player and that year over year, he basically changed himself physically and mentally. Yeah, and it's hard to remember that he's just 20 years old. He's still incredibly young. I mean, Gunnar Henderson might be in AAA, but that's a very rare thing. So he's still ahead of the curve as far as development goes. And yeah, I think he's got a bright future ahead of him. Yeah, no, I it was so much fun, honestly, as well, seeing that even last year with him still being 19, the kind of captain role that he took last year being around all year, and then this year being that bilingual linchpin between the English speakers and the Spanish speakers, and that he really took to that and loved it um, and didn't view it as a burden or anything. He, you know, he just went out and had fun. He said that was his goal from day one was just to have more fun this year and I think being around younger guys in a weird way helped him do that because he saw how much they enjoyed the game. So Heston Kurosad, after a long layoff, uh, made his official professional debut last week with the Sewer Birds. He's appeared in two games so far, um, and it's three for seven with an RBI. You've had a chance to watch him. How does he look right now, and what do you know about the Orioles' plan for him in trying to build up his workload after such a long layoff? So, I mean, everything that I've seen, I tried to watch as much video of him as I could from back in 2020 and 2019 just to see, okay, you know, how can we compare the two here? Basically, honestly, the first time I saw him, he kind of blew me away. Um, Shorebirds don't really have anybody that big anymore now that Josue Cruz uh, got released. But when you see Haskin, you're like, oh, my God, that is a, that's a large, thick human being. Um <laughs> And he still moves well. In the outfield, he looks good. His batting practice rounds are kind of what you would expect from a top five pick. It's got that different sound off the bat and makes you turn your head. Um, so from the, if you were to wipe away everything from the fact that it's two years since he's been drafted, and you know if he was a first-round pick this year, I think everybody would be very pleased um, with what they have in front of him. As far as what the Orioles' progression plan is for him. I don't know any more specifics than what the Orioles have released, unfortunately, which is basically they're going to take the same. If I were to compare it, we've had uh, Greg Cullen here earlier this year who was rehabbing a hamstring injury, and he was a little bit 
further back in the progression than where Heston actually is right now, and that Greg just played five innings one day in the field, five innings DH the next, then seven and seven, then nine and nine. Heston's already at seven and seven. Uh, I personally was a little surprised to actually see him play all seven innings on Saturday. Maybe that was just a function of the game being limited to seven, and they said, screw it, let's go for it. Um, but that you know, that's not the way the Orioles really operate, especially with Eston Kerstad. So I don't imagine that's the way that they were, you know, that they planned coming in that you're going to play all seven in the field today. And then Sunday probably would have been an off day. Um, if I had to guess, if we hadn't gotten rained down. So I would guess it'll be two days on, one day off, two days on, one day off for the foreseeable future. Try to get him those back to back days, one in the field, one DHing, and then eventually ramp it up to, you know, three days in a row in, or two days back to back in the field. Then you'll DH day off, something like that would probably be where I would think. And I think the biggest thing about it isn't even so much in the field. It's getting him as many at bats as possible right now. Um, so DHing might become a bigger part of it than we expect. Yeah, I just have to imagine it had to be such a relief for him and such a great moment to finally get on the field with a, a uniform on in an official game. And it was just so cool to see him get off to a, a great start. You know, the first two games, he's what, three for seven with the double walk, maybe even I don't know the specifics in front of me, but he, he played great. And uh, it was cool to see. And, and, you know, fans, I don't think it's fair. A lot of uh, Orioles fans have kind of given up on him already before he even got started. But seems like he's healthy and he's still only 23 years old. If he can finish this year in Aberdeen and then start in Bowie next year, he's not that far away. And I was honestly a little shocked, as you said, to his health, him being fully healthy. The double that he hit, that was just a line drive – you know, 25 feet off the right field line, right fielder slid, blocked it. And the great thing was, was that Heston hit the bag at first and turned it on and then took two. There was never a thought of, oh my God, I have a hamstring injury. I need to be careful here. Let's tone it down. It was, let's push it. And this is game two. So right. to be that healthy, not even just that healthy, but to have that mindset, because that for a lot of players is the thing that comes last is whether or not you feel healthy on the field mentally. Um, that was great to see. Yeah, no doubt about it, especially on a wet field like that. And, you know, one of the few guys that had some pretty good numbers to start the year for you guys was Isaac Bellamy, who just recently got promoted up to high A Aberdeen. And he, uh, he emerged as one of the better success stories of the season. What kind of player is he? And what do you think was the reason for his success with the Shorebirds? So he is a not... Oh, not a wild character in like personality. Sometimes he is, but he is wild just as a baseball player that he only really started playing when he was 12, born in the Virgin Islands, goes to the DR, ends up getting signed by the Duquette regime, and it's just kind of been lingering around for a little bit. Um, the big thing that happened for him this year was he dropped switch hitting uh, for at least the foreseeable future. He's no longer batting from the right side, which is actually his natural side. He's only hitting left-handed because he found he was getting so many more swings lefty. He's physically built. He, is, For being 20 years old, he is, you know, ri he's ripped. Um, and he can absolutely punish a baseball. And that's basically what he's gotten into. Uh, he won't really go the other way too much, but when there's a ball in the inner half, he'll put a good swing on it and make sure he does his damage then. Um, he'll go out the plate, and at a single-A level, that can really play for you. Uh, and over the course of the year, it did. he did have his hot streaks, he did have his cold spells. But overall, you know, that tends to even itself out. And for Isaac, that sits somewhere around, you know, a 260 average with a 850 OPS. And he plays a pretty solid right field. He doesn't steal as many bases as I think he could. I think he's got better speed than he lets himself believe sometimes. Um, so I think he could actually run more if he wanted to. Um, but overall, it was kind of watching a player mature and find, you know, where is my baseball niche? And for him, it was I can be a slugging corner outfielder. Um, and he really played into that and, you know, has fun when he does it. Uh, it's sad that we, that Charleston, when we were playing them and he hit for the cycle, when he's rounding third base as he completes the cycle with the homer, they cut to a replay. And what nobody gets to see is the fact that he actually grittied down the third base line <laughs> on his homer. He got <laughs> booed out of the stadium. It was absolutely <laughs> unreal. Uh, and the Charleston dugout started barking at him, but you know, that's the kind of guy that he is. He, he loves that kind of stuff. Um, and he'll be a fun one to watch if he can just kind of keep it going basically. 
Yeah, he also had that walk-off home run. So, mm -hmm. yeah, fun player to watch. He had a couple good highlights this year so far already. There was something you said there that I think is really uh, interesting and worth putting in perspective. He didn't really commit or start playing baseball until he was 12 and he was signed as a teenager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> about a you know, four or five year turnaround there, right. <laughs> being able to get signed. And obviously, uh, that was when the Orioles were doing a lot less in Latin America. So he was, he was signed in 2018, so he was probably one of, maybe, what, seven, ten guys that got signed and probably one of three or four that are still currently in the organization. Um, so I think that that says a lot to how much work that he's put in and how raw the talent still is. Um, and I think that that's why he dropped the switch hitting was that he's taken so few swings in perspective um, that trying to have two swings at once, even though he's very physically talented and was able to do that for a little bit just off of raw natural talent, trying to do that at a pro level wasn't going to work for him. And the fact that it's his non-natural swing, which is the one that he's committing to now, is an even wilder aspect of it, too. So we'll focus um, on a pitcher that has come to Delmarva recently and has broken out in a big way, and that's Carter Ballmer. Um, how long do you expect to see Carter Ballmer pitching three innings every Wednesday in Delmarva as opposed to Aberdeen? He has looked so good uh, to this point for a guy that barely threw in the two, past two or three years leading up to when he debuted for the Stewart last month? Personally, and this is – I have no solid footing to go off on this. This is pure speculation. Um, I would foresee him with Delmarva until he's gotten past that point where he's only pitching once a week. Um, I don't think it would do him a service or his recovery a service, putting him at a higher level right now, even though he would probably be ready for it and could do it. But I think part of it right now, in a weird way, is you don't want all these innings to be low stress like they currently have been with him just carving up everybody. But there is something nice about it that he is getting very much eased into it um, and getting to do it in a real environment as opposed to down in Florida like he had been doing. So I think until you see him start having those two-start week where, where he's getting stretched out to five innings, I don't think he'll be up at Aberdeen. There's just absolutely zero rush. Um the lost year with the, pan with the pandemic, obviously coinciding with Tommy John, there's a lot of ground to catch up on. And one thing the Orioles do value is that, in a weird way, the fewer pitches you throw on the mound during a week, that leaves more uh, bullets in your magazine, so to speak, as far as pitches you can then use in the bullpen. Um, that's one thing that they are really big on is that not all development happens in the game. And for pitchers, that's going to be in your bullpen later in the week. Carter's talked about that a little bit, um, that his bullpen that he does on Saturdays, he'll ramp it up to like 40, 45 pitches, essentially a, a second start of his in that week, except it's in a completely neutral setting where he can do whatever he wants. And I think that's a big part of his development right now, where he can still kind of search and feel things out. Because the other part of it is like every rookie at any level, there's no scouting report yet on him. Um, he's been able to get away with just fastball curveball. He hasn't thrown a slider or change up consistently for strikes yet. Um, but his fastball and curveball are both good enough that he can get away with it. <laughs> um, so I think they'd like to see him have that four, that full four pitch mix before they throw him up for a challenge at Aberdeen. But I don't think that they'll want to challenge him until it's fully time and ready where there's no restrictions left. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense to me. And there's some other, Obviously, talented young arms on the pitching staff as well. Juan De Los Santos, Moises Chasse, Raul Rangel, who's currently rehabbing, Hugo Beltran out of the bullpen. Seems to be just a matter of command and consistency for most of them to make the next jump. But uh, what are you seeing from the pitching staff as a whole? So as a whole, it's just kind of steady improvement, um, little piece by piece. And, you know, you'll see it in some outings versus others. De Los is a great example. His last outing was the most dominant I've seen him this season, six innings, 10 Ks. He absolutely carved up Fayetteville, an offense that put up over seven runs in four out of the five games that we played. Um, and he was just lights out. But his past three starts, he'd gotten shelled. Um, his stuff was basically the same. It was just a matter of control and intensity. Um, so for somebody like Dalos, he has the best raw stuff on the staff by a pretty wide margin. He'll sit 96, 97, wipe out slider. It's just about sequencing for him. And, you know, trying to figure out at 19, we saw actually 
at the beginning of the season, he would only throw like 90 to 92 in the first inning. And at first I got really scared. I'm like, oh my God, is, is something wrong with him? Like, is he injured? And then no, he'll just ramp it up to 97, 99 by the fourth or fifth. And it's, you know, it's just trying to figure out, okay, how do we get him locked in earlier? Um, for other guys, Hugo has been a great find. And personally, I can't figure out what it actually is that he does extremely well, <laughs> gets batters out consistently, because he throws about 89 to 92. He spots really well, really good control, and he throws a cutter as well as uh, he throws more of a slider now as well uh, to mix in. But hitters just look wildly uncomfortable against him. And maybe it's he throws a little cross crossfire, so he's throwing a little bit from across his body. But I can't figure it out, and apparently neither can the hitters. Um, <laughs> So Chasse has been a little bit different since coming off the IL. I noticed his velocity is down uh, a couple of ticks. And given that he hasn't been taken out of the game um, with the velocity drop, I think that might be intentional. Um, so he was coming out at the beginning of the year in his first two outings, throwing 94 to 96. But I think he may have gone too quick, too fast. And that's why he was shut down um, with a little bit of arm fatigue. So now he's come back and hopefully, you know, tried to find that where's that, you know, when you're when you're driving a car and you're trying to sit at like two to three thousand RPMs instead of going five or six thousand all the time. I think he's trying to figure out where that currently is. Um, so overall, as a staff trying for them, just figure out what gets me ready on a game to game basis and then staying locked in hitter to hitter and trying not to lose some of the battles that go extended and keeping that focus is a really hard task. I will say that one of the tougher things for us with these minor league injury stints, it's like, okay, does this guy have a dead arm? Does he have Tommy John? Like you can never tell until, oh, they're back. They're pitching tonight. That's great. So, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, the injuries down here in the minors, uh, I'm sometimes left in the dark as much as you guys are. <laughs> and it's just whether or not uh, I see it in game or if the player, they are under no obligation to tell me. Um, but if they do, then I know. Otherwise, it is just kind of uh, spinning the wheel of the old injury board and seeing where it lands. Right. So, um, talking about a guy that on offense that has just been on fire for the last few weeks, and that is Trenton Craig. Uh, he got off to a slow start when he came up from Florida, but has completely turned things around. What do you think has been the difference for him now compared to when he first came up? So there's a two-part difference. Um, one, he was able to explain to me. One, he wasn't able to. Uh, I talked to him for the game Saturday, and I always, the past week I've come up to him and said every day, man, you're looking good. And he's like, yeah, no, I'm feeling pretty good. And except on Saturday, he said, yeah, I know I'm good. Uh, so you know, his confidence is skyrocketing. But he said that compared to the first two weeks, he feels like he's finally himself again. Um, and I asked him, well, why weren't you yourself the first two weeks? And he said, honestly, I don't know. Um, and for a lot of guys, that's just a feeling out process of getting comfortable in a new in a new spot, playing professional baseball for the first time. There's a lot of factors that go into that. So he couldn't really pinpoint it, but he said, you know, I'm just finally feeling like I'm trending Craig again. Uh, the other part of it is, and this was what he was able to explain to me, is mechanical. Um, as far as the swing goes, he said basically when – he would take his stride forward, his hands were following him, which, you know, uh, compare it to a boxer. A boxer has a lot more ability to throw a dangerous punch if they wind up, boom, hit somebody, as opposed to starting from a standstill, coming at you. So he said getting that space in between his hands and what would essentially be your shoulder um, allows him to create the power that he does have. And he can really rocket some baseballs. So that was something that I was shocked about the first two weeks was that we didn't see that power because um, it's not like he was billed as a huge power guy. But as far as gap power and speed goes, he's a very athletic guy that the ball can jump off his bat. So I didn't know where it went. All of a sudden it's back and it's due to that change, getting that uh, hand and hip separation. Yeah, he seems like a guy that can definitely hit the ball over 100 miles per hour off the bat. Uh, good to see that he's got himself back together. Another guy who got off to a very slow start, and John Mioli actually spotlighted him in his newsletter today, is Creed Willems, the uh, young catcher who has a lot on his plate right now, learning a pitching staff, working through a language barrier, making adjustments at the plate at, what, 18 years old, so in his first real professional baseball season. But everybody that we've talked to has raved about his skills, his personality, 
how has the clubhouse changed since he joined the team? That's actually one thing I noticed um, in my game notes. I keep record of uh, everybody's uh, personal record at each position. And Creed's record since he's joined the Shorebirds, he's played like 25 games now. I think he's 12 and 13 as the team's catcher, um, which, you know, whether or not that's a coincidence or not, I have no idea. But for a team that is currently 19 and 37, I don't think that, uh, you know, <laughs> playing 500 baseball all of a sudden comes out of nowhere. Uh, so he, like Mioli's article really laid out well, everybody just kind of gravitates toward, towards him. It's hard not to either laugh, smile, or feel comfortable around him. He just kind of has that aura. Um, and he's put in a lot of time and effort and work into getting better. The first thing that John laid out and that I found out a couple of weeks ago as to why he's playing better was literally the classes. Um, there was a two or three game stretch. I think it was actually the when we finished up against Salem a month ago where all of a sudden he wasn't striking out as much anymore. And I noticed he was making more hard contact. And I asked him before the next game, like, what changed? He said, oh, like, no, literally, I just started wearing glasses. That's it. Like, I, I have not done anything else, I swear. Um, so, you know, for some guys, it's just figuring that little piece out that, you know, you got to be able to see the ball to hit the ball. Um, but otherwise, it is just how he works well with pitchers and understanding them and not being intimidated by being 18. Uh, or now 19, he turned 19 a week ago. Um, but that plays a lot into it because you can come in as a teenage catcher, especially I talked to both him and Baumler about it, that they're, I don't want to offend anybody here because I forget, they're the only two high school guys on the roster. Um, obviously you have a lot of international kids, but they all come in as a group and they know each other. But getting drafted as a high school player to the Orioles is a rather rare feat <laughs> at this point. <laughs> you don't have anybody else to lean on. So all of a sudden, you either have to mature very quickly in your mindset and how you relate to people to be able to hold conversations with college kids, or you're going to be left on an island. And both of them have done really well at adjusting to that, especially Creed, because you know he was drafted just last year and he has a much more front-facing position as opposed to Carter in that he's dealing with every single pitcher on the staff. And the fact that he's been able to cross that barrier, I think, says a lot about him. I think with young catchers, you're always kind of watching, like, what do they do behind the plate? How do they, you know, react after a bat at bat? Do they take that back into the field? It seems like with Creed Willems, he's pretty advanced in those areas uh, for his age, would you say? Yeah, uh, the arm is the thing that sticks out the most. Um, You know, everybody knew coming in that that was his carrying tool defensively. Uh, Pitch blocking is a harder thing, I think, to grade at this level. Because if you just look at the number of wild pitches uh, throughout the league, there's a lot of them. A lot of pitchers at this level are learning to control both breaking balls and fastballs. And you can't really fault a catcher for so many wild pitches at this level, or even pass balls on cross-ups, things like that, when sometimes pitchers aren't really giving you uh, too much hope to block anything. Um, But overall, I think he calls a very solid game. He blocks the pitches that you want him to block. And most importantly, he's constantly working hard back there. Um, he never really takes a pitch off as far as, you know, going to a backhand to try to smother something. It's always good mechanically. Um, and for somebody that, you know, for a while people, you know, didn't know is his future actually behind the plate? How long are the Orioles going to keep him there? He's doing everything in his power to make sure that that is his future. Um, this L. Day Stone is a player that we have been pretty high on since last summer. Matt Blood came on our show, talked him up. He put up excellent numbers in the FCL last year, got a cup of coffee um, at Del Marva to end the year and returned there this year, and the results have been kind of up and down for him. Do you think that Orioles fans maybe should lower their expectations a little bit with him, or do you think he's a guy that with time is going to make some adjustments and we're going to start to see better results? I don't think it's time to lower expectations. I think it's time to uh, elongate the timeline, I guess, is the best way to put it, um, especially with a lot of international guys, is that Dayson is still, look, basically everybody on the roster, you say this about, they're still 19. They have a long runway to work with here as far as getting better. It's going to take a good amount of mechanical tweaks and maybe a few mental things to help him. Um, but consistently, the guy that scouts tell me they like the most on our team is Dayson, um, whether or not he's playing well or he's playing terribly. Um, 
just from the physical build, you don't really find guys like that too much who have the kind of bat speed that he does, who runs as well as he does out in center, covers that kind of ground. It's just about right now. The thing that I noticed, um, especially tapping into his power, is last time I checked, he's got a top five ground ball rate in the Carolina League, which, you know, as far as whether or not you believe in the launch angle revolution, you can't be a successful hitter that you want Desone to be, especially one that you want to hit for power and hit that many ground balls. It's just not going to work. Um, so what I've seen is he gets, he lets pitches get a little bit too deep in trying to go the other way, either because he doesn't want to swing and miss, which has still come about a good deal. Um, which, you know, letting a pitch travel deeper then saps you with the ability to actually lift it into the air anyways or drive it with any power. So I think trying to catch the ball out in front will be the next step for him and then just trying to figure out how pitchers are game planning him because sometimes it seems like he goes up there and a pitcher flips in a breaking ball or deviates from the script that he thought that pitcher was going to go with and sometimes can just seem lost a little bit. Um, so... You know, the biggest thing that scouts have said to me, as much as they admire Dayson and think he has the most raw talent, is that guys in his mold are the ones that are hurt the most by the lack of short season right now. That that would be a really good place for him to go and figure things out. Because otherwise now it is just you stay here and you stay here until you figure it out. A good comparison, I think, uh, would be to the Fredericksburg Nationals, uh, Jeremy De La Rosa. De La Rosa looked atrocious last year, and we saw a lot of them. We played 36 times against the Fred Nats. And he looked. He had an OPS under 600. He struck out in half of his at-bats. This year he's hitting like 330. So, you know, give it a little bit of time, and depending whether or not Daystone figures it out the second half of this year or maybe come back for another go-around, there's still a lot of time left to be had to figure that out. Yeah, I have noticed that he's walked a little bit more the last week or two, and I did see him sting a ball that the second baseman uh, made a pretty nice play on and caught. So still high hopes for Desone And another guy who can draw a, walk, draw a walk, Isaac De Leon. I mean, 20 years old and leads all of the Orioles minor leaguers in walk percentage uh, for those who have 30 at-bats at least. Do you ever see the hit tool catching up to make him a pretty good leadoff candidate uh, down the line? So I think that's actually... A, a, a kind of seesaw problem for De Leon right now is that he is being a little bit too passive at the plate that it doesn't allow him to tap into his hit tool right now. He'll take so many pitches and try to work the count so much that he gets into a lot of two strike counts and, you know, hitters are less successful in two strike counts naturally. Um, of late, we've seen that change where he's had more success in two strike counts and been comfortable, and that's why his average has risen. Um, but that'll be an interesting thing of whether of how they diagnose his uh, current passivity at the plate as far as, well, he is taking all the walks that we want him to, but at the same time, would we rather have him swing more at this level because we want that hit tool to flourish? Um, it, we're kind of working at an extreme pole right now that with the amount of walks that he has. Um, so I personally would like him to swing a little bit more because we already know that he does have an elite eye at the plate. If we, if the Orioles go ahead and say, hey, we know you can take pitches, we know you know your strike zone, but don't be afraid to let it fly um, and let your let the barrel eat, let your swing eat, because he is a really good hitter. He has one of those rounds of BPs that, again, you turn your head at. Um, he's got that physical size that I think that can lend to him being a very good hitter. It's just about getting that A swing off as many times as possible. I think he sometimes will just paint himself into a corner of getting into a pitcher's count. Yeah, it sounds like me trying to play MLB The Show. I'm either <laughs> swinging at everything or I'm waiting until there's two strikes. So, yeah. You've got a few new hitters down there uh, right now, and Elio Prado, Frederick Ben Cosme, Steven Acevedo. Uh, you haven't had much of a chance to see them, but uh, from what you have seen so far, what are your thoughts on them? I absolutely love Prado. Um, talking, I got a chance to talk with Kobe Perez last week. He was in town and talking about how you discover those those trade pieces. Um, you know, everybody, it may have just been a running joke at the time because the Orioles are, are the Orioles, but everybody gave the O's a lot of flack in trading Kashner for two 17-year-old Venezuelans who we're not going to see in the next decade. Well, 
we're finally seeing Prado and Romero. And personally, I like what I see. Elio's got really good athleticism. For him, it's going to be about staying healthy. He's back on the IL, um, which, you know, that sucks with a little bit of a hamstring tweak. But he'll be back relatively soon. Um, but when, you, when he plays in game, he just has a very natural feel for the barrel. Uh, for him, it'll be about growing into the power. Because uh, right now he hits a lot of line drives, which is awesome. But, okay, how do we turn those line drives into extra base hits? Um, he plays a really good center, has a good arm. He kind of is what uh, Mike Elias built him. Built, or, a lot, yeah, it was Elias then, 2019. Uh, <laughs> time flies. <laughs> but he was what Elias built him as, as you know, a potential very well-rounded center fielder. Um, as far as Ben Cosme, uh, left-handed hitter who, again, has a good feel for the strike zone. His, all of his hits so far have actually come the other way if I'm remembering off the top of my head correctly. So he's shown that he's willing to be patient at the, at the plate and go the other way. Uh, Acevedo, I honestly haven't seen enough of since he didn't play Saturday night, just the one game. Um, but he's a guy physically 6'4", like 210. Um, he reminded me of a little bit of a slimmed down, uh, and not in a bad way, slimmed down version of T.T. Bowens. Like I imagine that's what T.T. looked like before he got to his full size. Um but I think that that's what Acevedo could be, uh, eventually getting to that point as far as very well built. That's pretty exciting. And also exciting is Luis Valdez. How fun is it to watch him on the base path? So he's one guy that at the end of the year, I knew he had good speed, um, but it's very hard for me to actually gauge what his speed is like. So I got around talking to scouts, and one scout put a legitimate 80, 80 grade on it. He had him clocked at 3-9 to first, uh, which is just unreal. Um, so in what Scout told me was you don't see 80 grades enough that, you know, Valdez could literally do nothing else right on the baseball field, and he could still be a prospect because he runs that well. Um, he actually weirdly does everything you'd want as a leadoff hitter outside of walk as far as what a classical leadoff hitter would do. He hits the ball on the ground a ton. He goes the other way, but it – Right now, that formula actually isn't working. Defense is positioned well enough for him. Uh, they creep in a little bit, and they'll align themselves just right. That, that chop around the second, the you would kind of pull it a little bit towards the hole. Second baseman right now is fielding that in the third hop without having to move. So it's about finding more line drives for Luis. He's shown actually a little bit of power as well, which is surprising, um, and the ability to play – five different positions, all infield spots, actually six, all outfield spots, second, third, and short. Um, so he's very versatile. So, you know, there's no reason to think that he can't keep on going up the ladder. And the other thing with the speed as far as stolen bases go, and this is something Felipe Rojas Jr. talked about, is that right now Valdez is just stealing bases because he can. Um, he is still very raw as a base runner as far as learning pitcher cues, uh, learning how to time pitchers, things like that. He's just stealing bases because he's insanely fast. So once he finally learns how to be a great base stealer, there's even more that he could be grabbing out there. And he's been doing that lately. He had two stolen bases this last week in the same inning on throws back to the mound, where he just timed up the catcher and the throw back to the mound. And he's done that four or five times this season. That's one of his favorite things to do. It's so much fun. Oh, I hope he makes it to the majors. I want to see that on a, in a Major League Baseball game. Um, are there any players we haven't mentioned so far tonight that you would like to shout out for their contributions either on the field or off the field? Um, so actually a few guys who aren't with the team anymore. Um, the guys who actually just got called up to Aberdeen, Dan Fetterman, Dan Lloyd, and Carson Carter. I know Carter has had a little bit of a rough start to his time up at high A, but – he was one guy that I would talk with almost daily about the art of pitching. And he's somebody who really gets it. Um, and the other thing is velocity wise, a lot of people don't understand. He actually has a lot left in the tank where don't surprise, be surprised to be somebody who pops up one day throwing 97, 98. Um, he's got a very lanky build and uh, our pitching coach ran some tests that I have, I have no idea how it works, but basically it ends up telling you, what your body's actually capable of. Um, and for Carter, it came out as you could throw like 99 um, if you do everything right. So there's that. Dan Lloyd, again, another back-end type of guy who just 
battles and guts it out in the mounds. And then Dan Fetterman um, is somebody similar to Carter, where his velocity won't ever get to that level. But should he add just enough where he could sit 92, 93, he really has some good off-speed stuff, a really good changeup, a really good breaking ball. Um, that you know, we saw his first uh, outing against Aber- or for Aberdeen went really well. Um, so I think that you know sometimes numbers can be a little deceiving. Yeah, I think it's it's a good idea for fans to keep that in mind when you're just looking at the box scores. Oh, this person has such and such ERA. Well, you don't know what they're working on. You don't know, you know, a lot of we don't have stat cast for the minor leagues publicly. So, yeah, a lot there. And one last question. Are you looking forward to a few weeks after the draft when you have to learn like 10, 15 uh, <laughs> new players and <laughs> pronunciations and stats? And- oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, last year, um, getting the 20 new guys on one day was uh, it was a ton of fun, but it might have been the most stressful day I've had in my life. We happened to have that same Tuesday. I think we pulled tarp like three or four times. Um because we're like, we cannot have this game tonight postponed. We have right. to. Let's, so, you know, I'm running between pulling tarp and getting guys headshots, walk-up music, just meeting people and faces. We've got a ton of media there and trying to figure it out, so it was hectic. But I am looking forward to that again. Uh, I've thought more about where the Orioles might go draft-wise, and I still have absolutely no idea. Obviously, nobody knows. And I'm not even talking with the first overall pick. I'm just talking more... Uh, throughout the draft because obviously they've leaned so college hitter heavy and college pitcher heavy that you know just the pendulum swing back another direction now um we have absolutely no way of knowing but that's something that's popped into my head just a little bit that maybe it could happen given where things currently stand in the minors as far as not even positionally but just age wise um you know there's a little bit of that glut at high a and double a as far as just finding guys playing time that I would, I would be personally floored if that has any effect at all on the draft. Um, but that's you know the kind of thing that I think about. So, yeah, you should be able to know enough about Drew Jones. You know, if they go that route, just con- considering his father and all. Yeah, Drew Jones or Jackson Holiday. Holiday would be um, special in the aspect of the Orioles have had uh, quite a or Shorebirds more specifically have had quite a few guys from Oklahoma State come through the program. Um, so they have played under both Jackson's uncle and Matt has been a volunteer assistant there over the past couple of years. And Matt Holiday was like one of my favorite players growing up. So I talked with Jensen Elliott and Jake Lyons about, oh my God, what was it like with <laughs> Matt Holiday and Doug? That's awesome. <laughs> but it'll be interesting to see where they go. And then once the draft actually happens, obviously last year we saw a big wave of promotions up to high Aberdeen. With this crop of guys, given how much younger they are, I have no idea what direction you end up going with that. No. Um, yeah, that's a great question. You know, I have seen other organizations. Fayetteville just came to town. And, you know, Eli- former Elias uh, stronghold there. And they actually had a few guys on their roster this year who were sent down back to the FCL once the draft class came last year. Um, do I think that that's the right way to do it or the – right option i don't know it depends on how everybody takes it personally and understanding that you know how the business of baseball works and that this move doesn't say anything about you it's just where we're at right now and the fact that we don't have short season baseball anymore but you know that is something to consider well sam thank you for this excellent insight tonight uh we really enjoyed not just having you on the show but listening to you call shorebirds games so make sure we tell our listeners where they can find you Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it is literally just my name, at Sam Jelinek. If you want to follow the Shorebirds, it is just at Shorebirds. If you want to follow or listen to the games, uh, we're on the road this week in Salem, so I'm on the radio side of things. Uh, you can listen to that online if you go to theshorebirds.com. <laughs> do I wish I have a broadcast partner? No, I, I, I do have a broadcast partner. It's it's called Me, Myself, and I. Um, <laughs> but I wish I did because sometimes, man, I'm going crazy up there talking. <laughs> but uh, you can go to theshorebirds.com, click on 2022 broadcast link, uh, listen to it online. And then we're at, when we are at home, we are on milb.tv, which uh, I will say hopefully in the coming year, I'll put an S on it just in case, we will have a center field camera. Don't worry. We know. 
and we try to put that roaming camera out in center whenever we can but that one has is duty bound for uh the promotions in between innings so whenever we don't need it there we send it out to center but man it is uh we're we're working on it don't worry Hey, you're not alone. Aberdeen <laughs> doesn't even have an announcer, so. <laughs> oh, don't don't worry. I, I haven't been asked uh, about why that's the case at all. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Sam. This was awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. Of course, uh, Sam Delnick, the voice of the Delmarva Shorebirds, and uh, Bob, a lot of good insight in that interview. Obviously, about the prospects that we talk about a lot on this show, whether it's Heston Kerstad or Michelle Alde Soon, but then some of the guys that we don't always have the chance to talk about week after week. Yeah. I feel like I'm actually going to have to go back and listen to this one myself. I usually don't do that with our episodes. I feel like there was a ton of great information crammed in here with all these guys that have, you know, not as much information about. So yeah, this was an excellent interview and uh, I'm sad Nick couldn't be here to take part in it, but I'm sure he'll, he'll be listening either live or on playback and uh, enjoying it as well. Yeah. And before we get into our discussion of the big news of, the early part of this week, which is Kyle Stowers uh, promotion to the major leagues. We want to plug our Patreon community and our new member who has joined it. And I'll turn that over to Bob. Yeah, we got one new member, um, Ryan McGonigal. I think we can just call him Professor. Welcome aboard. Thanks for joining. Good to have you. Good to have you, Ryan. And with that, Bob and I will go to the big news that broke on Monday, which is that Kyle Stowers was added to the 40-man roster. I believe the technical term is that he was purchased from AAA Norfolk and called up to the major leagues. It was expected we might see Stowers in Toronto this week based on some reports that had been emerging over the last week or so, but it seemed like the direction that those were going in was that Stowers would be added to the taxi squad. In other words, we would probably only see him if there was an injury that was unexpected, and after a few days, he'd be back in Norfolk. The Orioles instead add him to the 40-man roster. They had him in the lineup on Monday night up against Toronto and Alex Manoa, who right now is one of the Alex Manoa, who right now is one of the best pitchers in the American League. So Stowers getting the tough test on his first night, but nonetheless, uh, very excited for him to have this opportunity, even if it is short term. So, Bob, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, it's very exciting. I actually have the the game on in the background here, just keeping a, very, barely an eye on it. But I saw that Stowers struck out on three pitches in his first at-bat and then flew out to left field on a full count in his second at-bat. I haven't seen him make any defensive plays. But even if it is just four games and then back down, we know he'll be back up soon as soon as somebody's traded or someone's hurt. I think it's, it's not a bad thing to uh, let him get his feet wet, let him get a taste. Yeah, tough, tough matchup with Manoa right off the bat. But hey, you're going to be facing tough pitchers in the major leagues no matter what. And um, yeah, maybe if Yusniel Diaz wasn't hurt like 87% of the time, then maybe he would have got this chance. But uh, yeah, I, it's still exciting. And, you know, I hope he can somehow find a way to force them to try to keep him up by the uh, by the time Friday rolls around. Yeah, and I realized I got a little bit ahead of myself there, although I think most of our listeners probably have been following what's going on that due to Canada's COVID vaccination laws, Players who are not fully vaccinated can't play um, in Toronto this year. Keegan Aiken and Anthony Santander were added to the restricted list before the series began, and neither player traveled to Toronto. So that was it was known at that point, although we didn't know for sure until Monday who was going to go on the restriction list. The expectation was that the Orioles would have at least one or two players that went on the restricted list. Um, Enrico Garcia was the other player coming up from Norfolk the right-handed pitcher taking Aiken's spot. I think with Stowers, you know, we knew that this move was coming at some point this year. It was just a matter of what was going to be the thing that made the Orioles finally do this. And I don't feel like development-wise, he really has much left to prove at AAA. Uh, with the way that he performed there last year, the way that he climbed out of a slump this year and has cut back his strikeouts pretty significantly, I'm not sure how much left he has to show, but it's a matter now of when does that long-term window open for him? Right. It's just about where, because they're not going to bring him up to sit on the bench or play, you know, half the games. When he comes up, he's going to be like Adley where he's playing pretty much every time, every night out, maybe a, a night off a week. Uh, yeah. I saw on the broadcast that he had a 1100 OPS over his last 23 games, something like that. He, 
he cut his wall, uh, excuse me, he cut his strikeout rate by like 9% since uh, his time in AAA last year. His walk rate is right around what it was last year as well. So cutting down the strikeouts, st- still hitting for tremendous power, leads all the Orioles minor leaguers with 12 home runs and is tied with Jordan Westbrook with 16 doubles. So yeah, I think he's pretty much ready. Even his batting average at 253, which play his BABIP is like 289, which is not terribly low. But when you look at his BABIP uh, in his other years and, and uh, trips, what whatever teams he was with since he was on three last year, uh, his average is a lot higher than that. So a little bit of bad luck there, perhaps. Yeah, I think he's pretty much ready. It's just a matter of finding him, finding room for him on the roster. Just to put this out there, you know, we pretty much fully expect that when the Orioles do come back to Baltimore on Friday begin, to begin their series against Tampa Bay, that might be when you see Stour sent back to Norfolk because Santander will be off the restricted list at that point. But what do you think it's going to be, Bob, that eventually allows Stour to get to the major leagues for good? Is it a Santander trade or is it something else? Or do you think that there is a possibility that maybe in these – four games he could make the case and ultimately convince the Orioles that he needs to stick around longer. I've been trying to figure out a way for that to happen. I, I, I'm not sure I see it unless, you know, it doesn't have to be Santander. It could be Trey Mancini. Cause then, you know, maybe you can rotate someone in at DH, but with Mancini, Mountcastle, Hayes Mullins and Santander, I just, I can't really find room for uh for Stowers to get every day at bats right now. So I think whether it's an injury to one of those guys, hopefully it's not that, or it's a, a trade of either or both of Santander and Mancini, then yeah, unfortunately I don't think it's going to happen, but also shout out to Rico Garcia who took Keegan Aiken's spot and he's had a really impressive uh, year this season coming back from, I think it was Tommy John. It was some kind of pretty serious injury where he didn't pitch in 2021, but he started in high A Aberdeen, worked his way up to double A Bowie and then, obviously triple a Norfolk and has been really, really lights out 28 years old. Not sure how much of a, you know, few future potential he has, but just good to see him get this shot. Yeah. Garcia has had two sin- uh, short stints in the major leagues before one with Colorado in 2019, then San Francisco in 2020. He's a former 30th round pick by the Rockies in 2016. So a guy that's been in the game for a few years now, but, um, coming into tonight, had just 16 career major league innings. So good for him to get the opportunity to come to Baltimore. And, you know, given how teams need pitching over the course of the year, perhaps this opens the door for him to get more opportunities as the season rolls on. Yeah, for sure. So we'll go in now to our final segment of the night, which is where we like to shout out players who, outside of our top 30, who have done something notable of late, whether it's been a good game, a good week, perhaps something to be like in their stat line. Um, and we do this every week. I'll turn it over to Bob for his picks uh, for this episode. Yeah, I'm definitely going off of the top 50. I think actually both of these guys might not even be on my top 100 list, but they've had really good weeks and just interesting seasons altogether. Davis Tavares is going to be my hitter who, you know, he's a guy that all of a sudden he was with the FCL Got a little bit of a taste with Delmarva last year. Started this year on Delmarva, excuse me, Delmarva's roster at 23 years old. He's a little bit older than these other international guys that um, we just talked about extensively with Sam Jelinek. But he started bouncing around to Double A, High A, back down. You know, just it's what you see right before someone gets released. Unfortunately, a lot of times. But I feel like Davis Tavares is is doing his absolute best to prevent that release from happening with high a Aberdeen this year, 40 plate appearances. He has a 876 OPS, a 135 WRC plus batting 316. Um, he's been playing pretty good ball. And then we also heard that he had some pretty impressive uh, at bats with double a when he was up there. So whether he sticks around here or he's just trying out for another team after this, uh, happy to see him perform pretty well. And then my pitcher is going to be Ryan Conroy, 25 year old eighth round pick out of the 2018 draft. So a Duquette guy um, we've talked about how, what was it? Justin Ramsey and Drew Rahm talked about how he's got some pretty interesting stuff and he had a 5.94 ERA 
with double a Bowie over 16 and two thirds innings, but he was striking out almost 12 batters an inning. His ex fit was mid threes and he's now up with triple a Norfolk and he has an ERA just below one. And, uh, he's striking out guys and, and not walking many either. So he can give you multiple innings, just a, an intriguing arm to look out for in, in the future. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people inside the Orioles organization have singled out Conroy when they've been on this show. So I'm definitely interested to see what he does at the AAA level. For my picks this week, I think anyone who's been following the farm system closely in the last few weeks will not be surprised by his hitter. And that is Maverick Hanley, who just continues to roll. Uh, slowed down a little bit towards the end of the week, but um, good numbers, you know, the way that he has been hitting over the month of June. And the other thing I need to point out here is the defensive play he made the other night in Harrisburg. I think it was the ball was popped up on a bunt attempt. Hanley gets up very quickly, catches it, throws it to second base, and nabs the runner who had just gotten a little bit too far on off of second base. Uh, we've seen Hanley make a lot of great defensive plays in his time in the Orioles farm system, but if you head over to our Twitter, at BSL on the Birds, and check out that clip, uh, Hanley once again impressing with his defense. And my pitcher is Peter Van Loon. Uh, this is one of those Aberdeen pitchers that has sort of emerged, not really out of nowhere, but not a guy that was a big hype name coming into the year that has just been consistent all season. He's had two starts since our last show last week, uh, both against Brooklyn, and combined in those outings, he went nine innings, allowing one run on six hits with 13 strikeouts against four walks. The first of those outings resulted in a win. Uh, that was back on June 7th. And then his outing on Sunday resulted in him being named Baby Bird of the Day, which is a pretty good achievement from us. So Van Loon has been just about as consistent as any starter in the Orioles farm system this season, and he continued that last week. Yeah, I'm not sure who I'm more impressed with. It's Van Loon for his pitching or for Nick, who kind of called him out before the season started and, and predicted this, although I guess – if you predicted it for any of the Aberdeen pitchers, you would have been right on the money because their staff has been incredible. So, yeah, great, great calls there. Yeah, absolutely. And even, you know, guys that we didn't mention tonight, like, you know, Justin Armbruster, Ignacio Feliz, Gene Pinto has been healthy and his last couple of starts have been, or his last couple of outings have been really good. So Aberdeen's pitching staff continuing to roll. Um, so, Bob, before we sign off tonight, any final thoughts? No, great show. Um, missed Nick, but... We had a worthy successor slash guest in his place this week, Sam Jelnick. Hope everything's going good with Nick, and he'll be back next week. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to – oh, actually, there's. I just remembered what I wanted to say. If you want to become a patron of ours, we I am launching a new monthly podcast focused on baseball cards and, more specifically, the Orioles and how they relate to the baseball card industry. So going to have Jimmy from uh, – Bleacher Birds previously, and now he's on Twitter at O's Card Giveaways, which is a great account to follow. Uh, great guy. And Fernando, who reached out to me. So a couple of good guys. I'm getting to know them. And we're going to put out our first show on YouTube as well as the patron podcast feed next Monday. So stay tuned for that. Definitely going to want to check that out, Bob. It's like a really good initiative. So interested to see it uh, come together. Uh, we will be back on the air next Monday with a new episode. In the meantime, check out BaltimoreSportsAndLife.com for all of the latest articles on the Orioles, Ravens, college sports, and more. Bob has a couple of new pieces up on the site uh, this week that are worth checking out. And when you're over there, hop on the message board to join the discussion with readers of the site as well as some writers. Um, and follow us on Twitter at BSL on the Verge. We'll have you caught up with Orioles minor league news throughout the week before we are back on the air next week. Uh, thank you again to Sam Jelinek for his appearance tonight. For Bob Phelan and Nick Stevens, this is Zach Spedden. You've been listening to On the Verge.